Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fool. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs, of course. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicum? I was never a good reader. Ah, Immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? We're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Hi, I'm Justine Sloan Lees, welcoming you back to another audiobook podcast. And we've got a really interesting episode in store. I shouldn't say that. They're all interesting, aren't they? But we're going to be discussing accessibility in the audiobook industry. There's some extremely important and meaningful work being done in this area, especially here in Australia. And who better to delve into this with than our guests from Vision Australia, Andrew Furlong and Robert DeGraw. Thank you for having us in your studio. We normally have people in our studio. It's nice to be in yours. Nice to be here. Square Sound has worked alongside Vision Australia for a few years now because the books we record for one of our main clients, Hachette, we do a conversion of our final WAV files and then it allows you make the audiobook available on your DAISY system. So we're going to be hearing all about that. It's been great to be able to work alongside you for that time. Now, Vision Australia is a not-for-profit organisation and it's the leading national provider of blindness and low vision services. They support many, many thousands of people of all ages and circumstances through their online services and at Vision Australia centres like this one we're sitting in today in Kooyong in Melbourne, plus others all around the country. There's some really amazing stuff going on here. So let's hear from our guests. Andrew, would you like to tell us about yourself? A little bit about myself. Uh, I have a technical background. We're sitting in a studio and that's full of technical equipment. So my role here is a technology support manager. I have a small team that coordinates everything from sort of research and design, acquiring equipment and technology that we can apply to what we do through to maintaining and repairing it, such as the equipment uh, in this studio, the delivery, uh, responsible for the delivery of our talking books and alternative formats to our clients, for them to be able to read the production of those alternative formats or the equipment used to produce those, all the way through to the players and the reading devices that our clients use to read those accessible formats. Robert, you and I, alongside Ben Johnson at Belinda, are the people who've been producing audiobooks for the longest now. We've all been doing it since last century. I don't know Ben Johnson, but I know he is very highly regarded at Belinda and by all who've worked with him. So tell us about you. Well, yes, I have been doing this work for a long time. In fact, I might just mention my origin. I had done a university course in literature and media studies, including sound production. And then not long after I finished my course, I found out about the position at what was the Braille and Talking Book Library in South Yarra for an audiobook producer. Uh, and I went along and they took me on. And um, so that was early in the 90s. And so all through the 90s, I was working there on the reel-to-reel machines, the Revoxes, and eventually we merged with a number of other organisations, blindness organisations like the Association for the Blind and the Royal Victorian Institute for the Blind. And then the Umbrella organisation went through a few different name changes until it finally settled on Vision Australia. So in that time, I've been overseeing the recording of books for the library collection, all sorts of fiction and non-fiction, mostly Australian titles, and basically been in charge of um, auditioning new you know, narrators, training them up, producing them, doing you know, edits that might be required at the end. Yeah, that's, that's basically been my job in all those decades. And I think you would have worked with Elizabeth Woods back in the day. I certainly did work with Elizabeth Woods. Um, <laughs> a uh, titan. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, she came from the ABC. She and did. she'd sort of been doing some notable stuff with them until she uh, ended up at our studios. And, yeah, we've had a lot of great producers that have worked alongside us. And so, yeah, again, those are people that I interviewed and trained up to sort of do that sort of work. And, you know, we always tried to find people who were very savvy in terms of their literary knowledge and their sensitivity to the text and things like that. So they would be good at identifying if there were misreads, you know, things that should have been emphasised and things like that. That was more of a priority than technical ability, which we felt would be easier to train people up in. And so, yeah, we've had quite a few producers over the years that uh, I think have done a fantastic job in this field. So let's talk about Vision Australia and the services that you provide here in more detail. Well, uh, I can tell you that (laughs) in terms of audio production, 
apart from the library books that I ever see, we also produce what are called personal support titles. So those are specific printed materials that individual clients may request to have recorded audio versions of. It may be a book, it may be a microwave instruction manual, it might be a bank statement, and we have a selection of magazines as well. But then we have the radio station, Vision Australia Radio, which is obviously an important part of the community. And yeah, I don't know if, if Andrew can sort of talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I can add to what you've said, Robert. So I talked earlier about accessible formats. So Robert's mentioned books, magazines, personal support. We do that in an accessible format, um, audio, braille, large print, you know, a range of things. The newspapers that Robert mentioned, we have a partnership with most, if not all, of the major news publishers, Nine News, Fairfax, News Limited, regional news publishers, We receive the text of the newspaper that goes to print at, say, 2 a.m. in the morning. We've developed the automated systems that takes that, converts it into a DAISY format, and delivers it to our clients who can subscribe to those, and it's delivered to their library, online bookshelf, as you and I receive the printed version thrown over our front fence. And that's possible through the technology that we have, you know, synthetic speech, for example, so a newspaper is not human read because you wouldn't be able to read the 400 newspapers that we can deliver each day if you had to human narrate those. Even podcasts, we can take a podcast and add that to our client's bookshelf. I've mentioned the word bookshelf a couple of times now, just like you and I have a bookshelf of print books. Our members have an online bookshelf associated with their library membership and that's populated with books that they can choose or a friend or family member can add to that bookshelf for them to read. Or we have uh, another system that automatically allocates books from our collection to that bookshelf based on that person's preferences. They might like a particular genre, crime and mystery, for example, but not something else. And we have the technology that can recommend books that we hope are interesting for that person to read. So very broad range of <laughs> things that we do. Sorry, Robert. Indeed. No, no, that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the DAISY system. DAISY is an acronym, lovely acronym. So do you want to take us through that? (laughs) In a nutshell, DAISY (laughs) stands for Digital Accessible Information System. Look, very simply, it's taking, say, an audio file, an audio recording, and adding to that some additional digital files to create what is called a structured version of that book. Think about a print book. You know, it has chapters, pages, and index. So a daisy book is an audio version of that in its simplest form that allows a reader to be able to navigate, just as you and I can navigate to a particular page or a chapter in a print book, a person reading a daisy book can do the same. Now they require a particular player, a daisy player, that recognises that format and those additional files that we add to the audio recording. Now, it might not be used by someone who reads a novel from the beginning to the end. They don't need to be able to do that. But say a student Mm. sitting in a classroom and the teacher says to the class, you know, turn to page 50 of your manual. Well, the vision impaired person sitting there in the same class can actually go to page 50 quicker than I can because they can do that digitally. And they go to the same page 50 in the daisy version of the book that we've created as the sighted student sees in their print version. So in the same way that I'd navigate around my Kindle? Yeah, very similar. Structured. So there's nothing particularly unique about a daisy book when you compare it to others, but combined with the way that we can deliver, you know, we have a bookshelf that's particular to a a user. We can then deliver the books on that bookshelf to the client directly to their player using a simple back and forward arrow key on that daisy player, go through their bookshelf and find the book that interests them and simply press play. Because for a blind person or a vision impaired person, I mean, people download audiobooks all the time, but they're being able to navigate on a device. And if you can't see the device, like I can look at my phone and say, play the next chapter. But of course, you know, if you're vision impaired, that's difficult. So that's where the Daisy Player comes in. And so the file conversion we do just adds all that extra data that then allows the person to navigate it. Yes. Wow. So how many people would use a DAISY player? The library has mm, roughly 17,000 members. Of those, I'm using round figures here, there would be eight to 10,000 active users, and by that I mean they use it regularly, either daily, weekly, maybe monthly. 
We mentioned the newspapers. There are those that use it daily to read their their newspaper. Mm. Others might download the books off their bookshelf onto their daisy player and take it away with them for a month. And we don't hear from them until they've read those and come, come back. Come back for more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's interesting you were saying about the newspapers and you use an artificially generated voice to read the newspapers, but that's not so desirable in the area of books. No, that's right. And, and for something <laughs> like a newspaper... We need it immediately, and the focus yep. is on the news yep. rather than the quality of the news, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, there's a place for it. Yeah, mm. Human narration. Uh, you cannot replace human narration mm. with a synthetic voice. Because I know some audiobook narrators who are really anxious about the future and what <laughs> AI will do and whether or not they'll have a job. Robert, talk to us about narrators you use and what you're looking for in narrators. Well, it is the case that all the narrators we use are volunteer narrators. Once upon a time, we used paid professional actors... Now we use um, volunteers. But, yeah, we try and find people who can read well, obviously, and people who are avid readers make the best narrators because they're people who have a much better familiarity with how to bring the words off the page and also people who have listened to other audiobook narration so they can hear the techniques that people employ when they're reading audiobook narration. I think that people who are not just reading the words off the page but it's been interpreted by their brain, you know, I think that's really important because I've heard a lot of people in auditions that they're just... They might have a really good voice and they read clearly, but the words that are coming out of their mouth are not really being interpreted in a way that brings much meaning to yep. what they're reading out loud. They're just saying words. Yeah, they're just saying in words. In order. Yeah. And yeah, you just don't want them to read flat. You want them to read with a certain degree of colour in the narration. So that's all very important. And we get people who find out about us through word of mouth or who might see when we're advertising you know, actively for new volunteers. They'll contact us and come along for an audition and um, we'll get them to read, you know, a couple of different pieces. And, yeah, we can quickly identify whether, they, you know, they have much promise or whether they, you know, are natural for this sort of thing or if they're going to need to do a lot more practice. And people do improve with practice, you know. Generally they do. Yeah. I often tell first-time narrators they feel like they could have done better. It's like you will get better and better with each book mm. that comes along. Mm. There was a survey done a couple of years ago by the University of Sydney of adults with print disability about what they dislike in audiobooks that they listen to. They complained about narrators that were poor or inappropriate, narrators that were unfamiliar with the topic of the book, pronunciations, mm -hmm. <laughs> monotones and inappropriate speed, so too fast or too slow, yeah. and also accents. Now, I would say that those bugbears are not exclusive to vision-impaired people. They are things that would irritate mm -hmm. all consumers mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. audiobooks. Yeah, I've yeah. known for a long time that you can have the best book in the world and if it's read by a mediocre narrator, people will turn off after 10 minutes because they just can't bear to listen to that voice. And then you might have a really mediocre book read by a wonderful narrator and it'll be compulsive listening the whole way through, no yes. matter how banal the book might otherwise be. I'll tell you, gentlemen, um, our mutual friend, Dave Jardinik, um, my husband is a librarian in a public library and he is always collecting material for his homebound customers and take them out to them. And he has one elderly gentleman who will listen to anything as long as it's read by David Chodinik. Mm. So it doesn't matter what the genre is. <laughs> yep. David could read kind of florid romance and this elderly gentleman would listen to it because it's just something about the sound of David's voice he loves. He's a good reader. There is also a case where you should have uh, the author of a book read their own book and they may not be the best no, read, but, not. but they can get away with Yeah, you, I think you make more allowance for authors reading their own work in terms of them not having the same degree of performance skills that an actor, for instance, will bring to a narration. Mm. I think readers will make more of an allowance because they appreciate the fact that it is the creator of this work reading his own words. But it is unfortunate that in a lot of cases, people who have written material, it might be poetry, for instance, a poet is not necessarily the best reader of their poetry, yeah. which is a real shame because you would think they would understand pacing and that sort of aspect of poetry I better than anyone. And they don't. Sometimes you see them doing a live read and they just rush through it. And it amazes me that they don't have more of a feel for how to bring out the qualities yes. of, the, of the poetry. As, as someone who spent a long time at the ABC recording authors reading their memoirs and poetry, you're so right about the poets. It takes every bit of tact to yes. work around. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I have had the instance where we decided that we would have an actor to read the poetry and the poet agreed and asked if he could come in and listen. And the reader was Bruce Miles, who's a fabulous actor. The poet was just blown away by the nuances that Bruce found that the poet said, look, I guess 
unconsciously maybe I put them there yeah. <laughs> or kind of knew they were there, but he's drawn them all out. He's brought them out. And then going to authors reading their own books, I remember a book I did about a Vietnam vet who was conscripted in 1966 from up near Mafra in the high country, got sent off to Pakapanyul, got sent off to Vietnam, came back and, as he describes in the book, spent 20 years having a slow-motion nervous breakdown. And so I recorded him. I went down to the ABC studios in Bensdale and met him and recorded him there. And it was a read that by any objective levels you would call flat, Mm. but you could hear the lived experience in his voice. And as you say, the listener can hear the veracity of the lived experience and that is what resonates rather than the, oh, they were a bit slower or they're a bit fast or, you know, whatever. So moving on now, I think it'd be great to speak about adaptation Is this something you encounter where you might need to tweak a text to make it appropriate for an audio listening experience? Well, although our books are generally unabridged, we may not necessarily include a picture section that's in the book. You know, we won't go through and read all the captions of the pictures and and so on. And on occasion, if we can drop diagrams, we will do that too, as long as it doesn't impair the text in some way. And we have to sort of work out how to incorporate footnotes and things like that into the text. Charts and tables, reading through those, that kind of thing. Exactly. And we sometimes will approach the authors of the books to consult with them about things. Um, It might just be pronunciation of the character's name. You know, we might not be sure how the author wanted this name pronounced. But yeah, sometimes there's a certain amount of collaboration that we do with authors. But yeah, most books are fairly straightforward in terms of how we do an audio version of them. It'd be fair to say we maintain the integrity of the books. That's really important. Yeah, 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 for sure. One thing we do is if there's a reference to as you read this book, would you change that to listen? Because I understand that there's some sensitivity around that within the vision impaired community that some people feel that they should experience the book exactly Mm. as written Mm. rather than have it tweaked specifically for them, taking something from the experience. I think in most cases we will read exactly what's on the page, but I'm sure there have been instances where we thought it made more sense to change it to something that was more reflective of the audio experience that they were having. Okay. And you've never had any kind of negativity around that? I have experience? never had yeah. anyone okay. sort of that I'm aware of complain to us about a change or anything like that. And that would come to the fact of something not making sense when you hear it as opposed mm. to seeing it mm. on the page. So mm. you make educated decisions, don't you, mm. before doing yeah. things like that. And again, just by way of comment, as you read something, and this comes to the point you made earlier, you don't embellish things too much, do you? You let the listener, in a sense, read, even though they're hearing it. Well, I mean... They're, it, they're reading it, yeah, the same. Although it is the case that in fiction, we generally will have our narrators doing a certain amount of characterization to differentiate the voices. And sometimes you'll have characters where they are speaking with a certain strong sort of accent or dialect or whatever, and it's actually written in the way that the words are appearing yes. in the dialogue with, say, a Scottish person with the ach and the I and the we. You can't do that in a normal voice. You have to do it with yeah. an accent. And so we would want to be confident the narrator can do that in a reasonably sort of convincing sort of way and consistently for whenever that character appears. But certainly if we have any doubts about our narrator's competence in doing accents, then we won't give them books that require it and we'll be okay with them just doing a fairly straight read for the dialogue, you know. I mean, still, you know, if it's a woman, they might deepen their voice a little bit for a male character and for a man, they'll lighten their voice a bit for female, that sort of thing to differentiate, but not the more challenging stuff that more skilled narrators would be required to do. Mm. Yeah. How does Australia fit into the global conversation in this area about accessibility, etc.? Uh, Vision Australia is part of a community, world community, of similar like-minded organisations. The library is a member of several international peer groups. The Daisy Consortium also represents libraries like ours in developing the standard applying the standard to the tools that are used to create this uh, information. Um, We also work hand-in-hand with peers around the world um, independently. The RNIB based in the UK, the CNIB based in Canada as examples. Uh, We work very closely with them to learn from each other. We are a not-for-profit organisation, we're not flush with funds, and nor are they. To achieve what we need to do, which you often can't go and buy off a shelf somewhere, you have to invent it, develop it or adapt it, which is part of my role as a technical lead. And we do that in partnership with others because you can't afford to do it on your own, nor might you have the skill in-house to do it. So you can leverage off the skill of others and the support of others around the world. 
You didn't mention how long you've been here, I don't think, but the change in technology you would have seen. I mean, Robert, you mentioned earlier that you started on reel-to-reel tape recorders, as did I, and our audio books came out on cassette. I remember having to record endless, this is cassette A, side B. Yeah. Please turn the cassette over. Please change the cassette. And at that time, back in the early 90s when we were doing that, everyone thought audio books were a dying thing, you know, with the change in technology and people adapting adapting to the technology and taking it up so passionately. Yeah, Robert and I have seen it all. (laughs) I think we're the two longest uh, serving employees. Robert longer than I, I think. Uh, So here at Vision, 17 years, and I've always been in this field almost my entire life. So I've seen it go from records to cassettes to CD to DAISY to online cloud-based delivery to you name it, from a recording on cassette through to MP3, which we all thought was going to mean the end of <laughs> the world. Um, you know, who would have thought? Um, and, and it's still evolving to this day. I mean, mm. yeah, synthetic voice is not all things to all people, but it has a place. And who would have thought that a computer can read something to you? And now with artificial intelligence, it's an interesting field. One of the things that we add to, say, Audible, does in a recording is the support of the end user of our service. I don't like calling them users because they're people. Clients. Yeah. And so it's not just a book, but we can also assist them in being able to find the right book, in being able to actually use their player to listen to it without trouble. Technology can be a great enabler, but it can also be a barrier to many people. And a lot of our clients are elderly and they've joined the library because as they age, they've lost the ability to read. It might even be they can't turn the print pages of a book Mm. or dyslexia, uh, severe dyslexia, for example. And dementia too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we we have a broad range of clients from children right through to over 100. So the benefit that we offer is being able to support them through that reading experience. Yeah. I mentioned dementia because I had an uncle who, um, as he began uh, unfortunate decline into dementia, couldn't focus on the words in the same way, you know, like his vision was fine, but he couldn't process them. And one of his carers suggested audiobooks and he took to them with great passion, just really changed things for him, yeah. gave him pleasure again. Last time I went to see him, he was listening to 1984 and reliving books he'd loved. When I saw that, I was like, oh, I'm really glad I do what I do and that you guys help with all the amazing work you do. Because of that, and because someone's lost their sight later in life, to then start to learn how to use a computer with no sight, and some of them have never used a computer perhaps, mm. you know, that's why we've got to often go back to think about ease of use. We use the term accessibility, but ease of use is just as important. And even... Uh, I've mentioned the daisy player that they use to listen to a talking book. You can have a player that has small buttons or a player that has large buttons. And so you need to be able to have a platform that someone can use to read that book. And they might be able to feel a small button, but they can feel a large button. Mm. I understand at present that the OB conversion, which is the conversion that takes a WAV file that we would normally create as part of our production process and makes it accessible to the daisy, is not currently accepted by the Audible platform ACX. Is that the case? Yeah, so DAISY, if you like, yeah. um, OB creates DAISY titles, just uses open standards, WAV files, MP3 files, the additional files that I mentioned earlier in this talk was just text files, HTML files. There's nothing proprietary about it, but you can't take such a book and read it on a proprietary platform. And there are reasons why uh, Audible and others, for example, do have a proprietary format that can't be read on a DAISY player, and that's to protect the rights of their, right, the their, rights, their holders. rights holders mm. and so on. So it's a murky area in there, but there are reasons for it. I mean, I guess you'd love to see there to be a bit more collaboration there as the relationship between Hachette. Yeah, and it's really important that we work closely in partnership with authors, publishers, the publishing industry. We're not here to compete. We're here to actually add value. Because I guess, Robert, for you, if a title comes up and you can see that it's been done already, um, someone else has produced it and it's got a fabulous actor reading it and it must be frustrating, I guess, at times if you can't then just access that to make it available. You have to do your own recording. Yeah, the library usually have um, certain you know reasons why they're not able to incorporate that other previously recorded book into the collection. They know our borrowers want to listen to it, want to be able to access it from our library, and so we have to record our own version. 
So it does seem like doubling up in a sense, but the library generally have good reasons for recording something that has been previously recorded. And how do you choose the books? We heard about when people specifically request certain things. Yeah, the library collection is run on what they call a a borrower-driven sort of collection. It basically means that most of the books are either books that have been requested by our clients or that the library choose because they are for genres that we know are very popular with our borrowers, like um, rural romances, you know. (laughs) So one's set in small country towns in Australia <laughs> with, you know, the girl who sort of, you know, meets someone that they once knew. He's come back into town and sparks ignite it between them. Yes, my um, husband, the librarian, would absolutely agree 100% with you on that one. Yeah, so that seems to be a very popular genre. And so, you know, they'll choose books from that sort of field, even if they haven't been specifically requested, because they know there'll be a readership for it. And as I mentioned earlier... Most of the books that we do are Australian. Occasionally we'll do stuff from the US or the UK, or in fact, we are currently producing some VCE texts so that students in VCE can listen to audio versions of books. And we're about to start a new book called The Memory Police, which is a Japanese novel, but it's been translated into English, but obviously originally from a Japanese author. So that's one of the exceptions to our you know, Australian content sort of rule. We occasionally do stuff from elsewhere. But because so much of stuff from the US and the UK is already covered by audiobook companies and industries there, we sort of feel like we need to concentrate on the Australian material, Australian content to sort of try and get that out there, Mm -hmm. Um, particularly books that may not be bestsellers, but more sort of literary books that might only sell 10,000 copies as opposed to a million copies, but which we think are well worth having in our collection. Mm. Yeah, like literary award winners and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that sort of thing. And there's always a spike when something does win the Stellar or whatever, it does spike sales. Hmm. Yeah. Let's move on to other developments. Would you like to tell us about the work you're doing with audio description? One area is theatre, live theatre. Vision Australia provides audio description. Oh, okay. Live in the theatre. I remember working with an actor once who said they were doing that. And often I know when I go to book theatre tickets, it'll have certain nights mentioned as having Mm. audio description. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some some interesting plays on at the moment or coming up. Macbeth, um, Mary Poppins, Romeo and Juliet, Moulin Rouge, Swan Lake Ballet even coming up later in the year are all programs that I know we're involved in to provide live audio description wow. for our clients who want to go there and sit in the audience. So the way it works is they register and they're given a set of headphones that don't take away from what they can hear live in the room. And then we have a volunteer who is there and narrating what's happening on stage that's not voice. So the person gets a sense of what you and I see. Yeah, and describing the costume, for example, and the set, you know, and Macbeth walks onto the stage, he's covered in blood and he's holding a sword type of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So really interesting work. Great. I believe they've also um, done some audio description for movies and TV shows in the past. I don't know how much that is happening now, but I know that um, not that long ago we had started doing a partnership with the ABC to try and start producing more audio described programs like there was a the comedy program on the ABC called Get Kraken mm-hmm. and we had done sort of like a pilot trial audio description episode for that but yeah I don't know whether that's advanced much beyond when that occurred Get Cracking with the Cates that's exactly it yes yes any advice for people wanting to work in this area <laughs> <laughs> where you start Robert <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, for, for narration, do you mean? If someone who wants to oh, narrate or someone who wants to be an audio producer? I think oh, yeah. you've covered narration yeah, reasonably yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I think um, as a book audio producer, I think it really does require someone who loves books and will have a good feel for when the narrator is narrating well and interpreting the text effectively. So, yeah, people who do have a literary background or love of books, uh, as well as having a certain degree of technical skill to operate the equipment and so on. Yeah, but, I've, uh, I've said this before, but I do feel that now with the booming in this area that a lot of young sound engineers are saying, hey, I do audio books. But in fact, they don't have that kind of understanding of text. Yeah, sure, they've got the technical ability, but that's the smallest part of the job, yep. really. Yep. Yeah. And there are some things that, from a technical perspective that you might think about either. I mean, recording sessions of a book are long. Yep. Um, you know, so things that you don't think about until you're actually doing it. And a book might take weeks, months to read over a separate yeah. session. So you also, as a, an engineer, have to think about consistency. By the time they get to the end of the book in, in a month's time, it has to sound the same as it did yeah. the first day yeah. they started. Yeah, you know, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Occasionally I'll have an actor start a book and then when they're somewhere into it, they say, you know, I sort of wish I could go back and do the first session again because I kind of realised that <laughs> my approach should have been slightly different or, or the way I was doing a character or whatever. 
um, I sort of feel like it needs to be more such and such. How long do you record for? How long are your sessions normally? Typically three hours. Okay, yeah. And then people can take well, as many breaks as they want, really, but yep. they typically will stop for 15 minutes yeah. to have a tea break. We do four hours. Um, the received wisdom at the ABC that I inherited from the ABC starting doing audiobooks in 1931 and I started in 1993 and the received wisdom was a half-day call for a single voice. Anything more than that is too taxing. Mm. And this girl I was recently recording who, it was her first book, and vocally at the end of that time, and we had a break in the middle, vocally she was fine, but I could see the mentally she was just losing that sort of sharpness and she was taking longer to sort of process her way through sentences and the pauses were getting sort of more regular and more often as she was just trying to work her way. And it's like, you know what, let's call it quits for today and pick up again tomorrow when you're not quite so fatigued. Just like, oh, thank you. Yeah, a lot of narrators, I think, realise they're making a lot more mistakes towards the end of a session that it's about time to call it a day. They do um, make more just, mistakes, don't they? So it not, becomes counterproductive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's okay reading a book, isn't it, to have some light and shade pausing as you read? I mean, it's very basic things, but important things. Mm, for sure. When, when I'm you... always bagging on about pauses. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, and even t- pops, sorry, you know, listening to a talking book through headphones, for example, is a very personal thing to be doing. And often our clients are doing it in their own space and people are going to sleep at night. So you need to be aware of distractions and loud noises like a, a microphone pop that might take a Yeah. Mm. I hate those big lip smacks and I feel that television presenters and interviewers do them to signify they're about to say something very clever or important or ask a really meaningful question. I'd love to talk to someone about that, whether or not they think that's become a cultural signified. Here's my very important Mm. question Mm. to you, Mr Prime Minister. I find the narrators do it with the character voices. Shall we do this? You know, sometimes it's in character, but a lot of the time I just end up cutting it out because I personally find it disorienting. And I know that with our proofers, we've got, oh, maybe half a dozen different proofers. And each one of them has like a peccadillo. Each one has something that they really hate and will always pick up. And I know that if that book had gone to a different proofer, they would not even have noticed that little catch on the end of the S's that somehow the mic picks up. So it's funny what our ears and our personal tastes are like, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I often think about um, years ago we had quite a well-known actor pop in who was interested in reading for us because he wasn't on any particular projects at the time. And we auditioned him and he has a slight lisp, which is not apparent when you see him on stage or on a TV show or in a film, but it was quite apparent listening you know, through the headphones as he was reading these audition pieces. And we didn't think we could use him because we thought it was going to be too distracting for the listeners, which is a real shame because he was a high profile person, but wasn't going to be fair to the listeners to have to let them hear this all the way through. Mm. I'd love to see your list. Uh, You mentioned earlier you've got a list of words you give to potential narrators. I must uh, get it off you and see if I can Mm. get them all right. Okay, for sure. (laughs) Yes, maybe we'll um, include some of those in the podcast. But yeah. So any highlights from stuff you're currently working on? I can mention that that we sort of uh, are involved with each year. is a selection of books that we're producing as part of the Victorian Premier's Reading Challenge. And these are books that we make available as what we call full text daisy books. And it means that for the benefit of readers that have some vision, but who may have a reading difficulty like dyslexia, they can follow the actual text of the book on a computer screen as they're listening to the book. And so each paragraph that's highlighted on a screen, they can hear the audio for that. And then when the next paragraph is highlighted, that's when they're hearing that next paragraph and so on. They can follow the whole text of the book in that way. It does require a lot more work at our end to format everything and to sync each section of audio with each paragraph. It's fairly labour intensive, but the end result is something that's much more advanced and and I'm sure of benefit to that particular audience. The ultimate accessible book, because it can be read by people with all different reading. um, Yeah, exactly. Robert, what's the strangest thing you've ever had to ask someone to do in the studio? Well, I... (laughs) I didn't actually ask them, but there was an actor back in the 90s who found that when he was reading, he was he felt more comfortable by taking his pants off. <laughs> and I, I indulged him, but, you know, I, I probably should have said, listen, could, I'd prefer if you put your pants back on. 
I've said this before in our podcast, but I've had to ask someone to remove a bra. The first time it happened was about four years ago. And I was like, wow, this has never happened to me before. But what happened was the fabric of her blouse was just pulling against the fabric of, they were just like slight friction. So that noise. Just that noise. And I was like, what's that noise? It's driving me insane. And I said to her, what's that noise? She said, what noise? And then she said, oh, is it this? And she did. I said, that's it. And she said, all right, I'll take it off. And I thought, that's weird. I've never had that happen before. I mean, yeah, taking off jewellery, all that kind of thing. Yeah, jewellery is a common problem. Taking off, you know, outer jackets that are a bit rustly, but never a bra. But anyway, Robert, I just thought I'd mention a mutual acquaintance of ours, Elizabeth Woods. She's an example of someone with a really incredible attention to detail. She came from the education department at the ABC, so she had a teaching background and brought with her that amazing knowledge of text, diction, things like that. And these days, sometimes I work with actors who say they can still hear her in their heads commenting on their narration. I certainly remember that Elizabeth was very strict about a lot of things, and whenever I say the word police, I know it should be police. (laughs) (laughs) That's something she drilled into me. But yeah, and so she would be fairly insistent on certain things with the narrators that she was working with about how they should approach certain things or pronounce certain things. And I thought that was fine. I mean, you know, it's good to have informed opinions about these sorts of things. Yes, I completely get that because I have certain things that I just will not allow. And it's like, no, you're not getting right. We're saying that in my studio. (laughs) But other things just have to let go. I was going to mention something else that I thought you might be interested in when you were talking about actors and book narrators who were doing maybe unusual behaviour. I had a narrator back in the 1990s who's sadly not with us any longer, but she was a professional actress who was a heavy smoker, and she was smoked during her narration sessions. Gosh. And so what she would do is she would read from a book, and when she got to the end of a paragraph, she would take a drag of a cigarette, and then she would start the next paragraph. And that's how it would be through much of the session. And then I think she would smoke again when she sort of went out for her break. And it did work in the sense that you couldn't hear her smoking the cigarette in the finished result. So she was pretty skillful at that. But it did leave the booth that she was recording in somewhat stinking for the next narrator and had to be aired out and so on. And so we felt sorry for the people that followed her. And then at a certain point, management put a stop to any sort of smoking that took place within the building. So that obviously meant that she had to stop doing that. And she was a bit disgruntled about that. But yeah, that was quite a unique situation, which I, I think Andrew might I, recall. I, I worked with her too, an amazing lady. Yeah. And you would let her get away with things like that because <laughs> she could read for an hour and not make a mistake. Yeah, right. she was very she, good. It, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And James Condon was a similar narrator I who knew was. James, yeah. yeah. He was very good at reading long passages without a single mistake and very distinctive, deep, resonant Fabulous. sort of voice. Very experienced veteran actor. Great book narrator and just you could get so much recorded without having to stop. Yeah. Have you found over recent times people are becoming more aware of accessibility in this area and that's generated more interest? Um, Again, working from a technical perspective, I'm sorry, publishers, I think, are more aware. So, yes, producers like us, accessibility is core to what we do, but publishers themselves are becoming more aware and so they're building in accessibility into the original source file rather than us having to add that at the end of the production process. EPUB is a new production format, for example, that has built in features for accessibility, which once upon a time were never there and never thought of. The international standards for creating publishing formats now have accessibility as one of the pillars of that standard. So from that perspective, there is a lot more awareness right at the very source of of the standards themselves that publishers use to create publications. Accessibility is now a consideration. Gentlemen, once again, it's been lovely being in your studio and chatting to you and hearing about this really wonderful work you do. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. You've been listening to the Audiobook Podcast, brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio at squaresound.com.au. The Audiobook Podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza with Chetna Chavla, together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan-Lees. Sound mix, Michael Zakaria. Special thanks to all our guest speakers. Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening.